o kia ora tātou, kanu i te mihi ki a koutou ko tai mai mō te kaupapa i tēnei rangi, uh, ki a koutou, hāneko, uh, kanu i te mihi ki a koe mō te mihi ki au, ki a mātou i tēnei ata, a ki a koe hoki uh, Stephen, kanu i te mihi ki a, kou, uh, ki a koutou. Look, in, in starting this conversation, I think it's only fair that I unpack culturepreneurship a little bit. Um, culturepreneurship, as I use it, is fundamentally a, a distant but uh, but none, nonetheless a cousin to entrepreneurship, but with a focus on explicitly the development of cultural capital and cultural outcomes. So it's something that embraces risk and it's something that also uh, enables innovation. So innovation is key obviously to entrepreneurship as is risk. It's about understanding that risk and doing it in a measured way so that you can actually um, create outcomes that are sustainable into the future. Art is the process obviously of the ideas process that processes that under, underpin the projects. Just moving forward, is it this one? Oh, there we go. When I was asked, the, when I was put, when the proposition was put to me about diversity, I had to look and think about it because it's not a common term that I use or think about, and I actually fundamentally don't consider myself to be diverse. I actually fundamentally don't consider myself to be marginalised either, nor privileged, and actually, in the spectrum of all of those types of terminologies, I try to largely stay free of them because I think it's a, a healthy way to be, in a sense, ignorant of, the, of some of the topical conversations that are going on at the time. For me, um, the things that I do are fundamentally about the kaupapa. They're fundamentally about the, the agenda of any given project and the communities that they serve. Um, and when I looked at this notion of diversity, I had to look actually at myself and understand how maybe I was part of that conversation. And that went to looking at my own whakapapa, um, which is a, a, a very layered thing in its own right. Um, and on the top left there, you'll see a man by the name of Thomas Halbert, who was one of the first trader whalers uh, into the Gisborne region, the Tūranga region. Um, he uh, was known as Henry VIII, and the reason he was known as Henry VIII is because he had six wives that went from Rākai Pāka to Rungawhakata and Taitonga Mahaki, uh, all of the iwi that I, that I whakapapa to. Uh, his encounter with Tūranga iwi was very favourable because he came on the right terms and it's something that I like to think about as the art of encounter. Um, and a little bit later I'll talk about Cook and talk about the way in which he encountered and maybe why it didn't go so well. Um, but then his influence on the next generation was significant. Um, the middle photo on the top, you'll see three brothers on the on the on this side. Orteni Pito, um, he was the first son born to a, born to a Rakai Parker woman, um, and he was the Fangai or the uh, adopted son and only son of a famous carver from our region by the name of Rahuri Rukupo. Uh, the middle son, my great great grandfather, Tami Arapata, was a well-known academic, um, formed the Tairafti Māori Association in Gisborne. And then the, bro the brother on the other side is Wipere, uh, the first Māori member of parliament in the Gisborne region. So the influence of Thomas Halbert Sr., of Tami Poto, or Tommy Short as he is known, on this next generation was significant. And it wasn't until the following generation, and you can see on the far top, um, Thomas Halbert and his young family, uh, that things started to, again, change societally. Uh, our family was well known as the Blue Bloods, uh, a term that obviously starts to address concepts of diversity because they were seen as adopting um, Western traditions, being very politically uh, very politically active, uh, but also, also embracing things such as academia um, and pursuits that were seen as being a departure from traditional society. I think that was what drove three of the brothers to go off to the First World War. So the three brothers were the first, second and third in the Gisborne region to sign up uh, to go to Gallipoli as part of the Māori Pioneer Battalion. And I think that was about servicing um, their concept of citizenship, and I think it was about um, also doing their bit in honouring um, their dual lineage. Then in the middle at the bottom, this is another generation later, my Norwegian great-grandfather. Um, my Norwegian great-grandfather came from Oslo, was in Samoa and imprisoned in Samoa by the Germans in 1908, and subsequently escaped and travelled down to New Zealand. And since then, we've had Scottish brought into the family. My cousins have married Brazilians and Costa Ricans. Um, but the point for me is, when in the base of what I do, which is uh, almost uniquely with Māori, is that I live in this place called Aotearoa, 
um, and my responsibilities to the land and to the people uh, who framed uh, my gene genealogy here. Um, I often get asked if I was in Norway, would I service the same um, whakapapa? And the answer is yes. Um, I'd love to, at some point in my career, uh, live in Norway um, and actually start to understand not only the Norwegians but the Sami uh, amongst other things. So diversity for me is a very personal thing and I think is a platform for moving forward is something that you actually have to understand uh, at an intra-level, not only in terms of the way we relate to each other. Um, this is a little bit later, Bid Hussein uh, will be speaking by, well his video will be playing and he's looking to tune in in some digital format. Um, he's from Birmingham and again I wanted to just show this image to make my connection to Birmingham in England. Um, about four months into Gallipoli, uh, my great grandfather, his name was Widamu Parikura Halbert, known as Billy, um, got shot in the shoulder and was uh, sent to Birmingham um, to recuperate. And his caregiver at the time was a woman by the name of Emmeline Young. And she took particularly good care of him. And my grandmother was born. <laughs> so after my grandmother being born, they returned back to, to New Zealand. Um, but I think, again, looking at the spectrum of how we interconnect is fundamentally important. So often we look at divisions uh, rather than connections, and obviously these things operate on a spectrum. Uh, my formative education uh, was in fine arts. I went to the Auckland University School of Fine Arts, Elam, majored in painting. Um, <laughs> very difficult process. Um, fundamentally, the saviour in my education was a man by the name of Don Binney. Uh, he was fundamentally um, analytical uh, and very sort of encouraging to, for me to explore the things that I love to do. Um, most of the other pressure, both within Elam itself but throughout kind of the, the art society at that time, was for me to be painting kurus. But I was in interested in deconstruction, I was interested in postmodernism, and I was interested in how Māori knowledge could be carried within those frameworks. Um, and so this is a work that I did not actually part of my coursework, but it's a, just a piece of word art that was inspired by a conceptual artist by the name of Joseph Kosuth. Um, and it was taking the dictionary definition of language and taking out the letters that you don't find in the Māori alphabet. And it was a statement about talking about two worlds. It was a statement about things that literally get lost in translation, but also about the impact of the written word on the nature of, and form of Māori knowledge. And a lot of what I'll talk today in the formative part of this presentation is about the need to reinvestigate frameworks, the need to understand frameworks and reapply them in ways that keeps an authenticity um, and intuitive, intuitive nature to the, to the knowledge it represents or frames. Um, I said I'd mention Cook. This is really important because it's obviously a topical issue at the moment both within Tūranga or Gisborne, where I'm from, uh, but also within uh, our various bureaucracies uh, in New Zealand and overseas. When I talk about frameworks, the whole commemoration process is pitched around the Sesta Centennial, 250 years. Concepts of time in this form are you not indigenous to Māori. And in fact, if we were to go back and reinvestigate that framework, and to actually use whakapapa, people, as markers of time, I think you'd find that the outcome was very different. This queer in the photo here was my great-great-great-grandmother. Her name was Māora Pani. She was born just after the arrival of Cook. Uh, this is a very early photograph. Um, and her grandfather, Te Ratu, was the one that set the welcoming party in Gisborne to go and visit Cook when the endeavour um, came into what is he... Uh, what he named as Poverty Bay. So if you take that framework and you start to situate it with people rather than time and people as markers of commemoration, all of a sudden you start to think about the way you uh, realise the opportunity in different ways. You start to think about what's the most important thing, and Stephen mentioned it in his um, opening mihi around people and the importance of people. Um, and I see in quite simple terms the most enabling strengthening and reconciliation filled opportunity is actually to bring together those people again. 
Uh, Cook obviously didn't have any descendants, but his older brother did. Uh, they like the descendants of people like Tupaya. Um, and the people of the descendants of people who are known less. Um, Toiro, who gave the original prophecy from Mahia Peninsula on the arrival of the Pākehiriwha, um, and also pr prophesied the arrival of Te at the same time, remembering that his prophesi prophecy around Te was about his ongoing bid to re retain nationalism, about Te Rākau and Te Maru who were killed, and about Te Ratu, who was the, um, the, the rangatira of Kai, Ngāti Kaipoho of Runga at that point in time. So it starts to be very different. It starts to be about people, not about an occasion, and certainly not a commemoration of a time frame. And then we start to look at other frameworks that I believe, and I do in my practice, continually investigate. Um, the first is our atuatanga, our belief systems. It's really important to investigate these and to start to understand the way in which they influence our decision making. It's certainly not to put one belief system upon another or to compare them, but to understand the framework in which we're investigating these things. So Te Reringa Wairua, or Cape Ranga on the left, um, this was obviously the place that Kupe named, so Kupe arrived in Aotearoa around a thousand years ago on a waka called Matahaurua. He returned to Hawaii and his nephew Nukutafiti brought back the waka after re it and renaming it um, Ngātoki Matafaurua. Upon leaving the Hokianga, he said to his people, you don't need to return, only your spirits do. And so he named Te Reringa Wairua as the place of the departing spirits. And from Te Reringa Wairua, your spirit goes into the domain of Hininui Te Pō, surfaces at the Three Kings, or Manawatafi, and boards the Waka Wairua, or the spiritual canoe, uh, through a number of stops back to Rangiatia. Why is that important? It's important because it continues to acknowledge our, whaka, our whakapapa into the Pacific. It continues to make connections that sometimes we forget we have. And then you have the overlay of Christianity and the missionaries. Um, this was taken obviously to uh, very easily for most Māori throughout New Zealand. Uh, the East Coast, like the North, adopted Christianity very freely and willingly. Um, but I think what we need to do is continue to reinvestigate uh, the impact that that had if we're looking to work off traditional platforms. Um, every time I say tradition, I sort of one, one eye winces because tradition is not really a Māori concept. Continuity is for things to be tika, for things to be continuous, and not at a material level, at an intangible level. It's about the sanctity of ideas through time and those responsibilities to the intangible domain, which includes whakapapa and people and values. But the introduction of the written word and the shape and form of our epistemology, Māori knowledge, actually has had a fundamental and detrimental um, impact on our ability to retain everything in a true um, pono form. It's not saying that it's wrong, but it's saying that we need to continue to investigate that. With Te Kōti, when he set up um, his uh, belief system called Ringatū, he didn't want it in the churches, he actually wanted it in the marae. And his, ideal was for it to hybridise in a form that was still consistent with our shape and form of knowledge. And then we talk about our migration theories. Obviously for a lot of Māori we, we talk about Maui and we talk about Maui pulling up the North Island and then in contrast you have the anthropological perspective premised on material evidence, Lapita pottery and language whakapapa and other things. They're at odds with each other but I guess I argue in the work that I do that that's actually not a problem. We don't say it doesn't have to be either or. You know, we don't debate the fact that the Bible says Moses split, um, separated the Red Sea. So why do we interrogate Maui? And it's something that I'm a big believer in is that these things can coexist and that they should coexist and that we should continue to embrace them and understand them for what they are as conceptualizations of reality and that over time those things change. One of the things that I like to uh, think about is this idea of looking at things in three, 360 degrees. In a museum today, uh, the anthropological ethnographic way that you interpret a carving is to look at the carving, to describe the carving, to say what it's made of, to say who it is and what it represents. From a traditional Māori perspective, it actually happens slightly differently. You contextualise yourself with the carving, not the other way around. 
So starting to think about those things and how we start to actually reposition them in the way we think enables a more fluid and a far more richer um, process when you're dealing with kaupapa Māori. The migration of the southern right whales and the humpbacks are a good example of this. Um, you know, they leave each year with the blue water, equatorial waters, as they moved, moved south. From a Māori perspective, the system of knowledge was always symbolised through the blooming of the Pahutakawa tree and the flights of the kuaka. What was actually happening is, of course, there's something happening under the water, and science over time has helped us explore that. And science should be embraced alongside traditional observation, traditional mātauranga Māori. Um, what's actually happening is the deep scattering layer is, is lifting as the polar caps are moving from the south. And then the warm water or equatorial waters are moving or gliding down over the cold water. And the fish and the broadbill fish and the marlin and, and then ultimately the whales follow in down behind. And our ancestors knew this. And so we used it and talked about it in metaphoric terms, about riding on the back of a whale. And we did. We literally rode on the back of a whale as they migrated south as part of that um, particular event. And then something particular that I wanted to talk about today before I give the examples on, on the projects I lead is the very specific and local uh, concept of knowledge and the way that the, where you live and the way that you're brought up informs and develops uh, your conceptualisations of reality, your frameworks and within Māori society, the metaphors that you operate within. Particular to the East Coast is a profound consciousness of light. It comes out of the easterly aspect that Gisborne and the Tairawhiti have. Tairawhiti by virtue is, means the, the sun um, dancing on the, on the foreshore. Um, we have a, a profound con relationship with light in Tairawhiti, partly because of the, the way that it casts shadows uh, but also because Tūranga Niaki, or Poverty, Poverty Bay, um, is actually a, a series of flatlands with a cradle of hills that sit around the outside. And the morning light casts really long shadows, and people can obviously relate to this in terms of Makan and the way he talked about Takaka, amongst other things. But it has a polarising effect on the way we think about community at a metaphoric level. The light is very distinct, and there's no way that that can be debated. But it started to impact our material culture, our arts, and particularly our carving. Since the time of Rukupo, uh, the, the Tohunga Whakaero, the carver I mentioned earlier, who carved Te Hoki Turanga at Te Papa, uh, Runga Whakaata have been known as the carvers of light and shadow. And like all sculptors' pursuits, our, um, our carvers of Runga Whakaata were principally interested in the way that they captured light and were able to cast shadow in the carvings. And this eventuated in a very voluminous style of carving. Now we've got a just step back one step and remember that carvings were our literature. Carvings did hold and transmit our traditional stories. So they weren't just ways of, they weren't decorative and they certainly weren't art in, in isolation, but they were the pillars of our identity, they were the things that communicated our stories and the way that we contextualise ourselves uh, with our stories. And so when you look around the motu, all regions have particular carving styles that fall out of the particular um, topographic, geological um, environments that they work within. I'd like to go on about that more, but I'm just going to keep moving. To give some examples of once you've started to reframe things and started to apply some of those challenges and some of that thinking into projects, um, is, is this particular one here. It's in the very early days of development, and it's a piece of work that I'm doing with a northern iwi, uh, Ngāti Kuri. So in the Muri Fenua, or the, um, the far north, uh, there's five iwi, and Ngāti Kuri are one of those iwi, and they have particular connection from um, Awanui, or just north of Kaitaia, um, to Te Rerenga Wairua. They have a shared whakapapa with all of the other iwi in that region, and in fact they have a shared whakapapa uh, with most of, um, of New Zealand uh, through a key ancestor of theirs by the name of Muri Fenua, who was the uh, mother to Toita Huatahi. The proposition put to me was that they wanted to develop a program that was commercially successful and culturally rich and intergenerationally strategic. Uh, so we looked at a long time trying to, under, trying to think through the way that we could identify the value proposition in the north. And what we landed on was this idea that waka 
canoes uh, were actually the most logical opportunity to establish a value proposition for Ngāti Kuri. The reason for that, other than the long history of waka in the north, was an opportunity to keep people central, because waka need people um, to, to, to maintain their direction. This was a strategy that was about platforming out of treaty settlement. The treaty settlement process is incredibly uh, damaging to, to iwi in terms of their social structures, traditional social structures. Uh, they encourage um, hegemony, and so rather than iwi looking at their connectedness, um, they're looking at putting in these things that we use so frequently today called pofenua as ways of marking territories. And it becomes more about ownership of land rather than oneness with land. Um, we needed to break that down, and again, when you go back to the waka as a model, they all, many of them share the same connections uh, to waka and the arrivals to New Zealand. So it was a framework that mediated some of those politics. But what we did is we actually put the waka in the landscape, and you hopefully can see the, the outline um, as the initial concept in the landscape. And the reason we put it in the landscape is um, to disrupt that perception of how we perceive waka. Uh, waka are often perceived as things from journeying to one point to the other across the ocean. And in that process, over time, Māori have become increasingly landlocked. The Pacific is our continent, and the more we encourage the development of waka, the more we can open up and continue those relationships with our whanaunga throughout the Pacific, and actually th throughout the world um, when we start to talk about the, the Pacific Rim as well. But it starts to also pay tribute to the interrelationship of our frame, our deity frameworks, our, our belief systems. Because most, the, the deity most connected to waka is in fact Tāne. And Tāne has become the god of the forests. That was part of the Christianization process where we actually personified, personified our gods. So pre-Christianity, um, our gods were the god of the forests. Tāne was the forest. And so when you took one of his children to create a canoe, uh, you continued to acknowledge him throughout the life of that canoe. And so the karaki or the prayers associated with voyaging mostly are about placating Tane, whose child you've taken from him. So it's to bring that back onto the land, that concept of that, um, that starting point of the canoe, but also to acknowledge in the process the tapuai, the footprint of the canoe, which is the opaque white space there, which is the, um, the, the pathway that it leaves. Um, and so this was a framework that we established, and where it will ultimately end up, um, and this is just starting to develop a little bit more, is in each part of the waka becoming part of the framework of the cultural and commercial development strategy for Ngāti Kuri. The Tauropa uh, will be a cultural centre, uh, which we're in the final stages of developing the concept for, including the concept plans uh, moving forward. We've purchased um, Ancient Kauri Kingdom and Awanui for those that, uh, that know that. And then Te, Rerengo, um, te Paki is the tauihu, the, the prow of the canoe. The Uru Matua, the widest part of the canoe, the, the beam, um, also has activity going into it. Um, and over time we continue to link through, an, through a, not an arbitrary but a neutral structure that informs and focuses our cultural um, and commercial developments. And then I wanted to talk about another program that um, is very fresh in my mind at the moment. It's literally one week on the water on its way to uh, the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History in Washington at the moment. And this is a, a program I've been um, running for a, a, a quite a while now with the New Zealand Māori Arts and Crafts Institute, which I uh, used to be the director of. And it's it's a, a exhibition and events program. I'm struggling with terminologies here because it's not about the exhibition. Um, it's about providing a, f a platform for exchange. Um, over the last five years, six years, uh, it's been in China, uh, in Kuching, in Penang, in, in Malaysia, and then most recently in, in South America, both in Santiago, Buenos Aires, and, and Rio, and it's destined for uh, LA in um, October this year. One of the things, and I talk about risk, and 
I was a bit flippant with my um, colleagues at Creative New Zealand this morning, but it's actually true is that it's gone out to sea and I haven't found the money yet. Um, we're in the process of it and I'm really confident that we will find it, but I think that's probably at the heart of the entrepreneurship story that I tell. Um, the money, we, we are very confident we will secure the money, um, but we have also have a number of strategies in terms of the ways we might underwrite it. We're not waiting for agencies, we're not waiting for funders, we have to have the conviction that this thing works. And luckily with this one we have the evidence, we can actually show that this engages tens of millions uh, of people through social media and visitation around the world. When we think about where we exhibit, the fundamental thing is context. And so this photo here shows it at the Gabriela Mistral Institute in Santiago de Chile. And the Gabriel Mistral Institute is a cultural centre that explores and celebrates modern Chilean identity. But why I was particularly interested in this site is that it was the site uh, of Pinochet's torture house during his dictatorship. And the torture house was actually burnt down um, and this new cultural centre built in order to celebrate Chile, um, diversity within Chile. The reality though was that the Mapuche, the indigenous people um, in Chile, live resident mainly in the south from in the Araucanía south region, um, had had little to do with, uh, with the GAM or the Gabriela Mistral Institute. And so this exhibition creates a responsibility upon the government. It is a political, it's a cultural diplomacy program and it creates in a gentle way this understanding and responsibility on their government to actually ensure um, engagement with Māori uh, in this process. We're not setting out to be cultural missionaries, it's nothing like that. What we're setting out to do is actually create environments where there's reciprocal and mutual, mutually beneficial outcomes, and it's all about the outcomes. We take a team of 30 people and each time we do it, I'm, my biggest hope is that somehow this has some kind of sustainable impact on the people that we actually take with us. Um, it's a large investment, um, but it's something that has, I have seen, really changed the nature and shape of some of the way uh, the teams who represent us there uh, work. We take a kapahaka or Māori performing arts group of around 14 to 18 people um, every time we go. Uh, we take multiple tāmoko artists, carvers, waka builders, um, and we do a numbers of lectures and seminars and uh, host functions at the New Zealand Residency with political leaders. Um, and underpinning all of it, we also look at economic opportunity. Um, I've heard it a number of times, and said it a number of times, but I think it's um, appropriate to say it again, is that engaging in commerce is not an issue um, because it's less about the commercialisation of culture and more about the reculturalisation of commerce. So starting to understand that and starting to understand that actually to adopt this position of commercialisation as something negative is assimilated in its own right. And we actually have to stop that and change that and actually be courageous enough to push into those spaces, but to do it in a way that's highly appropriate. And our knowledge frameworks already enable us to make those clear decisions. But we have to understand the frameworks again because we can't make those clear decisions unless we know where those delineations are. And so that's a challenge to us all as we move forward. And just lastly on this image, uh, this is an image of um, the Federal Congress in Buenos Aires. Um, it's an image I just really like, number one. But number two, um, it was an important ceremony this day where the witchy people of the, in the north of um, Argentina were requested to come and greet us in their Federal Congress. And at first we thought it was a, an appropriate process and we're looking forward to it, but what we didn't realise is this was the first time that any Indigenous people uh, in Argentina had ever been represented in the Federal Congress. Um, they did a what's called a Pachumama ceremony, um, which is a cleansing of the, of the Congress. And I think what was most interesting to me at the time was that the Speaker of the House and a number of the governors re reiterated the importance of the cleansing of a Congress in order to be able to move forward. So I think a really rich and enabling kind of uh, occasion. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk about another project that's very current. It's called Māori 2. Um, it started in around 2010-11. Um, for me, it came out of the back of New Zealand government giving their formal support um, for the UN's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, we were one of the last four countries to give our support for this declaration, alongside Australia, Canada and the US. 
And it seemed really ironic to me that the New Zealand government gave the largest international institution um, agreement to support Indigenous people and to endorse the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People without a conversation with Māori. And for the UN to be the kaitiaki of this declaration, but to be structured in a way that didn't enable conversations other than conversations between states. And so the voice would never be heard. But more importantly, we all know that the likelihood of actually even starting to begin to understand the minimum standards and integrate them into our own legislative environment was highly unlikely. Um, and our history within international conventions has shown us that. Um, so this project was about establishing a Whatarangi. A Whatarangi is a, a large um, storehouse. It's uh, on poles. It's elevated. It used to hold our ceremonial taonga. And the reason for that was less about protecting them from people, but people from them, because of the way in which they were used. And so they were elevated into these whatarangi, um, so whatas to, to, to elevate. Um, but the whatarangi are um, fundamental symbols of wealth, cultural wealth. They're fundamental symbols of the importance of our cultural heritage to future genera uh, generations. But they're also symbols of safekeeping. So from a Māori knowledge perspective, this was the appropriate framework to acknowledge um, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. But more importantly, the challenge was how did we do that as iwi, as Māori? And probably even more than that, how did we actually get that mandate? So first of all, we carved the storehouse. Again, had to be courageous. We pushed off, we carved the storehouse. UN didn't want to talk to us. New Zealand government was would New Zealand government were <laughs> slow in giving support, um, and, but since have been incredibly good. I mean, I don't, I, I get it. We were disrupting the process. These state-based relationships were all of a sudden getting questioned, and we were holding the UN accountable. And the New Zealand government didn't want to be embarrassed about that. I, I understand that. Um, so we carved, ca carved it in, in raka and wood, and then we set up a bronze foundry and started to cast the whole whatarangi, um, four tonne of it, into bronze. Now the reason for this was really simple. When we're talking about the relationship to our land and the rako, the, the wood and the tree that grows from the land, we didn't want to then give another taonga away. Carving's a reductive process and as you're reducing the wood, um, when you break down the etymology of Whakaero, whakaero. The ero is a, a, a maggot and it's eating its way through the wood and the carvers imbuing not only themselves but their knowledge in the wood and the cavity represents um, knowledge. So we just didn't want to give that away and so we thought we'd marry the reductive process with a reflective process in, in, in lost wax bronze casting um, and then it becomes a reflection of the taonga which retains its connection to the land. Uh, so we went through that process. It was a long, long process. Um, I have to say it was more troubling than what I thought it would be. Uh, but again, if you're not courageous and you don't actually push off, you'll, you'll never know. This was about 2010-11 when we started this. Uh, we're now at the point where we're having direct conversations with the UN. I took a delegation uh, from Tautanga Mahaki, uh, some of my relations from a from Waihiriri, uh, Kapahaka team, um, and we literally told the UN and the New Zealand mission we were coming. Um, we were facilitated and it opened conversations and then from that point the conversation with the UN became incredibly easy. Uh, they've openly acknowledged that we'd be one of three um, gifts uh, to, be, uh, to be accepted. Um, over the last two years. Uh, they had a moratorium which is now lifted. So now we're working through some of the intricacies. Uh, the intricacies, there's a, it's a little bit like a, a silent war. Um, there's certain things happening and not quite sure why they're happening in certain ways. Um, but our next step is to put in a container and send it there. Um, approval or not. Um, this is a symbol um, that supported in mandate by 68 iwi. Um, a gentleman by the name of Mauri Ora Kingi, who's now passed away, another guy by the name of Rahui Papa from Waikato Tainui and myself wrote a declaration 
we presented it to the iwi chairs forum and we got unanimous support and 68 iwi signed the declaration and support and it was an easy transaction it happened over two days um, i'm not aware of any other document that's been signed by 68 iwi in such a short amount of time so it's moving forward um, there's a number of challenges ahead um, here it is in finished form uh, we're just completing the engineering it's sitting uh, at Tapuia, you know, I had to get Tapuia and New Zealand Māori Arts and Crafts Institute to fund this, but accept that they had no control on the destiny of this Tonga. That was challenging, challenging for a board to accept all the liability, but actually none of the leadership responsibility or recognition. Um, but these are the spaces, and I think I can't quite read it, but Helen Clark made a wonderful statement, which which was bronze is a material that can stand for eternity, whereas wood has a lifetime. The use of bronze is a concrete statement of a culture that has stood through time and continues to do so. Helen Clark's been amazing in the support of this project, but obviously partially conflicted. Um, and so she's just had to manage her support on the way through. But we all know that these deals happen in the hallways, uh, not at the board table. There's a certain irony that I haven't got time to talk to you now, but about the use of bronze. It did disrupt the way that people think around Māori material culture, but in really simple terms, that concept of tradition, really problematic. This is a 7,000 year old generation. If you look at diaspora 7,000 years ago, our ancestors would have been populating um, in and around the Pacific Rim and most likely in contact with bronze. But more importantly, um, it's about ideas. I just wanted to acknowledge the, the leader of this particular kaupapa, he's the Paramount Chief of Ngāti Tūwhare Tō, his name's um, uh, Tātumu Teheru, um, and his leadership, he was a former um, chair of the UNESCO um, Intangible Heritage Council. Um, he's got, he's very worldly, um, has amazing um, and highly diplomatic leadership and uh, really supportive of this moving forward. So I'm going to leave it there, I've gone a bit over time. Um, I think if we're to sum a few things up, uh, I fundamentally think outcomes uh, need to be the focus. Uh, in the context of what I do, cultural and social outcomes, it's about maintaining and having a really explicit understanding of the, of the people that you're working with and the audiences you're addressing. I think it's really important to investigate frameworks, to be really analytical in the way that you think about the frameworks that you operate within, to embrace plurality, to understand that even within polarities um, there are spectrums and that we all sit along them in some form or the other. Don't be afraid to challenge convention. You know, Rukupu, who I mentioned earlier, um, my favourite saying at the moment was that he was the first postmodernist typographer in New Zealand, um, even though he lived in the eight, you know, early 18th century. Um, and listen and engage and I think fundamentally operate on a premise of humanity and try and keep hegemony at the door. Kia ora tātou.